for being with us for this uh, uh, webinar, new webinar uh, on, on the, of the series that we hear from uh, a CRT network. Today is really a great pleasure for me to, to host to have uh, Martin Anzik with us. We have been uh, uh, going after him for, for a while and tried to get him with us. And we were hoping to have, you know, I was saying that we were hoping to have him, uh, you know, here in, uh, in Venice. Unfortunately, this is not possible, but we still have, uh, we, we can still manage to have him virtually uh, online. So Martin is a, is a you know is a, a CLT fellow. Is a you know uh, he he holds he's a biologist. He holds a, a bachelor of science from Penn State. Then uh, he he also then he went to uh, to uh, Yale to, to for his PhD. Then he was postdoc at Harvard, and then at a certain point his path crossed the CLT. I think we will uh, will tell us a little bit about, more about this. And now is a is the head of this computer of this laboratory in uh, in University of uh, in Trento, which you know, who is uh, next door, and uh, we have a very good connection with them, and uh, and where is uh, now uh, currently associate professor. So and without uh, you know he, you know I could go on, but uh, without any further ado, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, please, uh, Martin, the floor is yours, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Professor Giacometti. Grazie for thank you for inviting me to the ECLT to give this talk. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. And, can, and if you have any technical problems or something, please let me know. Okay. So now you should be seeing my first slide. And uh, yes. And we, uh, I will be speaking about, there are a few things that I've been working on and I will speak mostly about, oh, I'm gonna speak exclusively about droplets today and the kind of technologies we've been using with these droplets, which we claim are lifelike. And I'll explain what I mean by lifelike droplets. And um, my primary affiliation is with the, in biology here at the University of Trento. It's been like this for a few years. And I also have a, a tie to the University of New Mexico in the US and I'm also an ECLT fellow. I'm proud to say. This is my email address. You need to, to find me. And my, uh, I was a postdoc, as you heard, in Boston for quite a few years with, with Shaw Stack. And I was offered a position at a funny company called Protolife that was just starting a startup company, which was starting up initially in Venice itself, but then moved to the, to the mainland. And at the same time, I became associated with the ECLT because the same grant that founded this company founded the ECLT. So I had very strong ties with, with, the, with them and I went back into the archives and I found this. This is the first slide of a talk that I gave at the ECLT. You can see the heading there. Uh, I was speaking about the artificial cells and at that time I was in Denmark actually. So between the proto-life stage and the Trento stage, I was in Denmark for a few years. And this is from 2008, Irene. Yeah, That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> even before I believe. Because and there's even, there are even older ones, yeah. I just couldn't find them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and so, um, so I've had a pretty strong association with the ECLT for, for quite a few years and, uh, and that's continuing now. And it's still because we have this, um, this mutual interest in living technology and there are different ways, of course, to define this. And I will tell you about my interest in, in living technologies. And um, so here's a rough outline of what I'm going to be talking about. First, I'll speak about um, self-moving droplets. And then I thought in the middle of that, I will try to say or ask, so what? <laughs> okay, so wh why, are you, why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? I don't know if I could sufficiently answer this question, but I will, I will attempt to answer this question. And then I will end with a different perspective uh, for some of you who are interested in origin of life and uh, origin of life. Uh, scenario. So that's the simple outline today. I won't get too technical, um, so get a sort of broader overview of these studies. But um, if you need to ask some questions, please ask me at any time. I'm very happy to to answer. So, so this approach is a very kind of old approach, which is very much sympathetic to the earliest definition of synthetic biology, like from this reference 1911, where Synthetic biology must proceed from the simpler to the more complex, beginning with the reproduction of the more elementary vital phenomena. 
So this is a bit in contrast to what synthetic biology is today, but from this perspective, I, I very much like this way of thinking about how you can uh, understand living systems by beginning with uh, some sort of reproduction of vital phenomena, whatever they happen to be. And can you actually do that in a laboratory setting? So where you control many of the processes that you might be interested in and do the proper measurements on these things. So can you recapitulate these things in, in the laboratory? And you could have a, an extensive list of what you might think essential characteristics of life are um, I recently, well, recently, it was two years ago, did a workshop um, in, in Latvia, and there were, it was a mix of scientists and artists, and our, and we did an active list of what are the essential characteristics of life, and we came up with more than 100 characteristics. So it depends on your perspective, what you want to add to this list. It's not an exclusive list or a, or a comprehensive list for that matter. But what you'll hear about today is basically embodying something um, that has some kind of at least rudimentary metabolism um, and is capable of self-movement. So at least these three things, um, very important things, but yet not properly approached with this system are what happens with information in the system and how, what can you do with evolution? But these are, are also fascinating characteristics and topics. But can you at least get a few of these things going? And um, I think one of the earliest droplet uh, artificial cell type things or proto cell type experiments is a very, very old one by Bushley, who was a zoologist. And what he did was he was studying the amoeba and he wanted to come up with a laboratory model of how the amoeba moves. So what he did was made a dish with fresh olive oil, like I have done here. I repro reproduced his, his uh, protocol. And then he added potash to it. So this is basically potash is, this, is a source for the name potassium. So it's potassium hydroxide. So you're adding a base to the system. And uh, you add a strong base to this and, and this is what it looks like. First, first red droplet here is just pure water in olive oil. Oops. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, because I have something frozen here. Let's see if I can get through this. I can hear you, that's good. Something's a bit off here on my computer. So you can still hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good. I think it's the movie which is freezing uh, your... Uh, your your laptop. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not able to get out of it. <laughs> okay. I will be right back. Excuse me. <laughs> right back. So don't panic. We lost we lost the speaker, but everything is okay. You know, it's, it, it, will, it will be back. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. 
Sorry about that, everybody. This is some sometimes happens. Yes, you are back. I think it's the problem with the movie. Yeah, I'm going to try to work around that. Actually, that's a good point. So let me share my screen, and we'll we'll try not to be too heavy with movies. Although although I have a lot of movies, so let's see. Good. We'll we'll work on it. Okay. So. <clears throat> I'm going to, it's not so big on your screen, but let's see if this is going to help by not doing the full screen. So what we're going to look at here is in this video um, is there's a red droplet that is placed in the olive oil, which is just pure water with some food coloring in it. And the next one is, um, is the basically the hydroxide. So this is the chemically active stuff. And when you put that in there, um, you can immediately see the difference in, in the behavior of these two systems. So oil and water don't mix, you just get a droplet that's fairly stable. But if you have a droplet that is chemically activated, so it has chemical potential um, and is performing some chemistry on the olive oil, turning it into fatty acids and glycerol, um, you then get some lively movement here. And this is what uh, Bushley was showing us as I think the first demonstration of an artificial cell that he created in the laboratory. And um, if you look at these things with a microscope, let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you guys. Okay. If you look at these little dro water droplets in olive oil, this is what they look like. They're quite interesting looking. These tails are the product of the saponification reaction, the chemical reaction that forms these things. These are active droplets. You get very interesting dynamics, group behaviors, fusion events, things like this other kinds of group behavior, like here's a bunch of these alkaline droplets in olive oil, and they're just processing the olive oil, producing, producing um, fatty acids and glycerol. There you go, you get the idea. Very strange group dynamics, um, just for free. If you want to do this experiment at home, you can do it just with some fresh olive oil and some, some base, and you can make this stuff work. Um, so very nice demonstration of movement that you can get out of a non-living system that actually resembles in some ways a living system. And this is one of the experiments that we developed um, in, when I was in Venice. Um, and it's, it's a dynamic droplet system where you have a dish and it's, uh, all of these now are, the experiments now will be macroscopic. So you can see these with your eye. You don't need a microscope. You just have a glass dish here and put some water in it, usually at high pH, maybe with some surfactant and things. Uh, and you add an oil droplet to it. And just an oil droplet won't do anything because oil and water will not mix. And there's no, um, there's no chemical potential. But if you add uh, some fuel, in this case for the chemist, it's oleic and hydride. This fuel in here is going to make the system, which is normally doesn't do anything, it'll make it dynamic. So we're now we're looking down on one of these systems. And this is faster than real time. So you can make an oil droplet that then self propels itself through the system, as you can see here. All the chemical details are listed on the slide. So you can see them. Let's have a look at this again. So this is the kind of phenomena we were able to show that just with you know, the complete listing of chemicals and conditions is shown up here. So just with a few things, we can get a self-moving droplet to, to occur in the system. And this is, if you want to then be a bit abstract and don't mind that, um, you could reduce uh, the term metabolism to a single reaction, which is basically hyd hydrolysis of this anhydride fuel into ole oleate, which is a surfactant, it's a soap basically, and protons. And it's interesting that this reaction produces protons, which basically changes the pH, because what you're seeing here, the blue liquid is a pH indicator. So wherever it becomes colorless is actually acidic. So you can see an acidic trail that is being formed from the, let's call it metabolism of the system. So that starts to make sense for us. Um, and because we see that these droplets are moving on their own um, away from their waste products, so away from the acid, um, we thought that we might be able to control some of their motion by basically 
playing with the pH of the system. So we take a similar experiment here with a self-moving droplet and we add a pH gradient. So first the droplet starts to move. And then here we add a pH gradient of high pH. So the system seems to move around kind of independently. I don't know if I would call it autonomously, but say independently. Um, and then when it encounters the gradient that I've created, it kind of hesitates, right? It kind of stops for a bit and then actually climbs to the highest point of that gradient. So it actually becomes a chemotactic system. Chemotaxis meaning directed movement um, in a chemical gradient. This is what's happening here. So not only do we have self-moving droplet, we have something that seems to sense its environment and we're able to control some of the movement of that. Um, so what, is, what are the sort of mechanistic issues here? One is this thing is sensitive to pH, as I just said. And the, one of the reasons or the main reason it's sensitive to pH is kind of illustrated here. So here's our droplet and here's the water around it. And what we have surrounding the droplet is a monolayer of fatty acids. This is the, this is, uh, this oleic acid is one of the products of that metabolism. And the, and the oleic acid could be in one of two states. So it could either be protonated or it could be deprotonated. And you can see this has a charge on and this does not have a charge. So this is very much nonpolar and this is polar. So the actual surface energy or surface uh, properties of these things are changing depending if you're in one state or the other. And that one state or the other depends on what pH you're at. So here, for example, is a titration of pH of these, of these fatty acids. And you can see just by going from high pH to lower pH, you can go from low surface tension to high surface tension. So the te that means the tension around the droplet is dynamically changing. And when the system is moving, it's because it is trying to go from a high tension state to a low tension state. And the lowest tension is where the high pH is, right? So, so when you have that high pH, this is the lowest energy state of the system. So the system is always moving towards where the pH is the highest and its own metabolism is producing this state here. So it's, that's why it's moving away from its own environment that it creates. So that's the pH sensor. And then you couple that with a liquid liquid system. It could be a planar system, but in this case we have a spherical system where you have a droplet that has this monolayer that is sensitive to pH. And around this droplet, because of this metabolism or the one that you impose upon it, you can change the surface tension on one side of the droplet versus the other side. And when you do that in a liquid-liquid system with a surfactant like we have here, this oleate surfactant, um, you basically end up with a fluidic instability or a Marangoni-induced flow of surfactant and the system becomes a convective cell. That means droplet is moving this way towards high pH and the liquid is actually churning like this, okay? It's coming, becoming a convective cell. And for those of you who are interested in fluid dynamics, we're talking about low Reynolds numbers here. So we have viscosity that dominates the system. So that means the whole surface of this droplet is moving and is, it, it is actually creating friction with the water. So it's swimming. Basically the same reason you can take your hands like this, put them out and push against the water, you're creating friction. So you can move when you swim. That's what this thing is doing by moving its surface. It's creating friction and it's able to move through the water. So these are swimmers. If this kind of mechanistic detail didn't make sense to you, um, this one might make sense to you. So I don't know if you know this kid's toy. It's a bag of like liquid, right? It's like a balloon that's in, this, in a kind of a, a closed loop. So there's a, a loop of liquid here. And if you ever played with these toys, if you grab one end of it, it just falls out of your hand, right? So you increase the tension on one side of this bag of liquid and the center of mass moves this way. So you have a displacement of, of fluid this way and then it just falls out of your hand. It's almost impossible to, to grab onto this thing with one hand if you're, if you're basically putting pressure on one side. So that's the tension, right? By, by grabbing this thing, you put tension on one side, which is there's no, um, and it's unlimited uh, freedom on the other side. And so the whole system starts to, move its fluid to equilibrate the tension. That's what's happening here. Because of this high tension, it wants to get away from it and it moves its fluid so it can come back down to low tension area here. And the mechanism is this Marangoni in induced instability. That's the mechanism of how this, how this works. And so as a result of this, not only do you get some self-moving 
things, but you'll get chemotactic type behavior. Um, for example, this kind of stuff, get pretty precise control sometimes of the movement of this stuff. So that's a good demonstration of, of what I'm talking about, chemical chemotaxis. And this is a demonstration of biological chemotaxis where you have a, a living dictostilium cell that has a cytoskeleton that is remodeling itself in response to a small molecule called cyclic AMP. And you just use your pipette to put the cyclic AMP in the environment and you move it around and the cell will follow this gradient. So it's direction motion according to the, the chemical landscape, let's say. So that's what we're demonstrating, but with a very, very simple system that doesn't, in, you know, doesn't involve proteins, for example. So this, this, this kind of cytoskeleton stuff with addictive system is very complicated biochemistry. And uh, our droplets are pretty simple fluid dynamical systems, basically. So there's our self-moving droplet. And this shows a little bit of the, you can maybe see the convective cells with this. Since I'm having trouble with the display, let me just make it big for a sec so you can see this better. So maybe you can see that you have convective motion through the center of each of these things. And that's the sort of physical mechanism by which these things will move. Let me put this away here. So what we argued based on those pre preliminary, previous set of results, um, we're looking at these self-moving droplets that we believe are sensitive to their environment. So they have a kind of a sensor and we have fluid dynamics that are giving motion and that these are things are coupled together. So by which the, the system, um, as, it's, um, as the chemistry is working, it's producing waste products that are allowing it, of course, to eventually reach equilibrium. But as it's doing this, it's actually moving away from its waste products, delaying its approach to equilibrium. So one of the questions that's still kind of outstanding in our minds is, is this an example of self-preservation? So is this an artificial system that we can fully describe that basically has a mechanism to preserve the self? Mm, that's a philosophical question here. So maybe we, this could be discussed. So um, if you put more than one droplet in one of the, in these systems, it's kind of fun. And we have a paper based on this, which I won't have time to get into. I'll just make this bigger for you guys. Move this out of the way. So both of these droplets are active. The color doesn't matter. It's a little bit faster than real time. And what we see quite often in these self-moving systems is when you put more than one droplet in them, it seems like the action or the presence of one droplet starts to influence the behavior of the second droplet. And so we've analyzed many of these systems by um, changing different parameters such as droplet size and things like this. And uh, it seems to be what's happening here that this kind of, there, there, there's some sort of, re, some sort of conclusion or hypothesis you can come up with that there's a kind of communication between the droplets. And it doesn't appear that it's a chemical communication. So unlike cells, which have these small diffusible chemicals so they can, they can communicate, it appears that these droplets are somehow affecting each other's movement through fluid dynamics. Because when these things move again, remember they're causing friction with the water and they're moving the water phase as well. So there's some sort of fluid flow interaction between these droplets, which make them appear like they're dancing together basically. So that's kind of fun maybe. And then we started playing with a different droplet system, which is even simpler than what I have described so far. So it's again, it's a macroscopic experiment. You have a glass dish and some water here, high pH and some, uh, some surfactant in here. Um, and we're using then one decanol as the droplet and no fuel supplied. So that droplet will sit there and won't do anything. And then we start playing with the environment just to see with a simple system that doesn't have uh, necessarily any chemical potential, what is it going to do? And this is a kind of a quick experiment. Here's our decanol droplet. Okay, this is on a glass slide, basically, that you're looking at here, two, a few centimeters. And we put in a source of salt here. So sodium chloride is added over on this side.
So you can see once that salt diffuses across the slide and encounters the droplet, the droplet is sensitive to it and then is able to move directionally towards the source of salt. Okay, so um, it's a very simple system. Again, it's looking at energy minimization. So this is the, these are the conditions under which I showed you that, how that took place in that experiment. For example, this could be the starting position of the droplet, and this could be the ending position of the droplet based on a salt gradient of sodium chloride. So more salt you have, the lower the tension. So just like the previous droplet experiments, it's looking for the lowest energy state of the system. And so it'll move, even though, um, you know, even though it looks like it's moving across, it's just moving across a dish or something like this or across a slide. Um, and it, this is the energy landscape that it's playing with. So it's actually just looking at where's the lowest energy of the system. And once you have understand that, you can do something fun like this, which is good for publicity. I don't know if it's good for science, but <laughs> let's say uh, it, 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 it captures people's attention. So um, here's that same droplet here that won't really move around. And here's the salt source here of sodium chloride put in this end. There you go, right? No problem, no problem. So this is an intelligent system, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it's an intelligent system because all it's doing is energy minimization. So we see it as a, as a two-dimensional maze, but the droplet from, let's say, droplet point of view, it's simply that this is the lowest energy state of the system and it knows where to go because it's sensitive to the salt concentration that it's in, in the environment. Okay, so those are just some examples of fun with self-moving <coughs> droplets. Um, does anyone have any questions so far on this stuff? Otherwise, I can move on to the important question, so what? Um, so one thing we started to do is like, well, what can we do with these systems? Uh, For example, Martin? Yeah. Uh, is there any organism, a cellular organism, that even remotely utilizes the phenomenology that you have described to move around? Um, you will see um, some convective motion of cancer cells growing in capillaries. Very slow dynamics, but it, it has basically a convective type motion to it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, so what? Let's see. So we tried to then do some experiments with this droplet system where we can maybe move stuff around like putting solid copper wires inside. So potentially conductive things and then moving them around in different ways with different solutions and stuff like this. So we're able to basically transport um, different kinds of things around. Right now we're just adding a bunch of different surfactants and things. And then we want the droplet to let go of the, of the, of the copper wire and then move the droplet out of the way. And that's what it does. So we're able to kind of do some transport of this. And um, we then tried to do the same thing with living cells and it became a big problem because basically everything dies. This is a you know, chemical system that was basically optimized to work under circumstances which include very high pH, like pH 12, for example far or far away from physiological pH. So then trying to interface this artificial system with a biological system was really actually quite difficult. And so we wanted to try that though. So we wanted to make our system compatible with cells, but also make the cells compatible with the decanol droplet um, and also be able to have it as a transporter. So we're able to couple it and decouple it from the droplet. So it can release the cells from the system. So they're not, let's say consumed by the system. And one of the ways that people use for tissue engineering for biological systems, a very common thing is people use this kind of thing called alginate. Um, this gel is pretty easy to make a hydrogel out of alginate. It's used in various types of applications and for example in the medical industry and tissue engineering and it just looks like this jelly stuff that's here. 
And cells can be embedded in this stuff because it's like very aqueous, um, innocuous stuff. And cells could be, could go in there. So we made a droplet here, an experiment. And we put one of these uh, little alginate capsules inside. We call them capsules. It's there. That's that little white thing where the arrow is. And we made a gradient. Droplet moves, but the capsule stays there. So there's, there's an incompatibility between this hydrogel and this, and this droplet. And it should be maybe no surprise to some of you that this is true because these things are hydrogels. That means they're very, very um, uh, hydrophilic. And an oil droplet is hydrophobic. It's the opposite, right? So these things don't want to mix. So you're not going to get easily a hydrogel embedded into a nonpolar liquid. So we had to play with that a little bit. And the answer was we could actually um, play with the surface energy of this hydrogel by adding a little bit of surfactant into it. So this is the same surfactant I talked about before that makes the monolayer at the interface. Put a little bit of that in when we're making the gel. So all of these are, are flat pieces of gel. And then you put a water droplet on top and you see what the contact angle is based on how hydrophilic or hydrophobic these things are. And as you put in more and more surfactant, you make the system more and more hydrophobic. So you can turn a hydrogel into something that is at least transiently hydrophobic. So you can mix it with oil. That works really well. So here we have two droplets with two little packages there. I don't know if you can see them, They're two little tiny things. And they're in the trailing end and it's moving those little packages around of hydrogel. And then we decouple them and then we move the droplets out of the way. So we're now we're able to successfully package up some stuff into hydrogel capsules, have them move through chemotaxis and then deposit them in the system. So we tested a bunch of things, what we had around the lab, some, some uh, uh, bacteria as well as yeast. And we tested for, first of all, are they going to survive? So are they going to actually make it? Is transport going to happen? So are you still going to have transport and still have the cells alive? Um, is the system going to be sterile? Which means when you put the, your living cells in a, in a capsule, pulled along by the droplet, is the whole system becoming contaminated with the living cells or is it gonna remain sterile? And is it gonna remain aseptic? So it, which means when you do an experiment with two packages of cells, um, do they cross contaminate each other, right? So we tested all of these different things. So this is what we did. Here's the outline of the experiment. Two droplets, two different capsules. One has cells in it. This is this one here with the yellow. The other one is a control that has no cells, but if it gets contaminated, we'll know about it. We put in this salt gradient, the system, will, the droplets will move the cargo over here. We then decouple this by adding, it's just very high surfactant basically. We decouple this, this uh, association between, between the capsules and the droplets. Put another gradient, move these out of the way, and then harvest these capsules and see, is anybody still in there? Are they alive? Have they cross-contaminated each other? These kinds of experiments. So we'll just take these out and basically you can see maybe some little capsules here on these petri dishes and you can see that there's quite a lot of growth from some of these samples. E. coli, for example, um, Bacillus subtilis survives, yeast survives. Vibrio fissurae does not survive this, uh, this uh, procedure. Yeah, so some bacteria are sensitive to it and uh, others are not. I think there's a message or something in the chat. Wait. No, we haven't tried. Uh, that's a good question, Alex. We haven't tried any other kinds of bacteria, for example, um, bacteria that can thrive at high pH. We don't know if the, we don't know if the problem with things like Vibrio are because of the high pH or because of the chemical environments, such as, you know, decanol is a bit, it's toxic to some kinds of cells, for example. So it could be the chemistry, it could be the pH, it could be both. So no, we haven't tried anything, anything more than what I've just told you actually, Alex. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So anyway, these are just the, the results of that. We don't I just explain that to you. So then we tried a harder target because it's fairly easy to grow robust uh, cells in, in 
in the lab and, and hopefully they'll be strong enough to survive this crazy stuff we're doing to them. So then we try to transport viable human cells. And this, this, the previous work and this work was all done by uh, Sylvia Holler in, in my lab. And um, so in this particular case, what we did was we grow up a bunch of living cells from humans. So these are human cell lines. And you incubate them in this buffer, which happens to be pink, by the way. It's a DMEM. That's the color of the buffer. It's pink here. Um, and you um, put this, sorry, you put the living cells in a capsule in this hydrogel. You put it into this growth media and you let them grow or at least survive inside of this media. And what, you're, what we found is that some of these cells, these living cells, as they're growing, they produce surfactants for us. So these are biosurfactants that are produced uh, naturally by these cells. And then when you basically then put in your droplet to transport this little capsule from A to B, then you, you, you harvest these little capsules, you harvest the cells and you do viability, metabolic activity tests. You know, are they still there? Are they still metabolizing these kinds of things? And uh, the good news is yes, for many cases, we can get this to work. And the interesting thing about this maybe is I told you that for droplet system one, droplet system two, you get this chemotactic movement because you have this monolayer of surfactants at that interface between the droplet and the, and the water. And in this particular case, uh, we don't have to add the surfactant anymore. So the association of a hydrogel capsule with the droplet is due to a formation of interactions with the surfactant, with the biosurfactant that stabilizes the association. And the chemotactic movement from A to B is also done without us adding any surfactant. So the only surfactant in the system is whatever the cells produce. So if the cells produce surfactants that are in the solution it, it, that are sensitive to, P, to salt or pH, then they can move along this gradient to the source of the, of the chemistry. So, so in this case, the cells are producing the surfactant for us. That's what they have to do. So that also means, so we did tests with, by killing the cells, they don't do this anymore. So that means we call this auto-selective transport of mammalian cells because only cells that are alive and producing surfactants under these conditions will be stably associated with the droplet and be transported. So you have to be alive to participate in this system. And this is just some data from the paper that I think is, is quite interesting. We have a, a cluster of points when you look at, for example, what is the velocity of the droplet versus what is the change in surface tension, right? That's that difference in tension, difference in surface pressure I was talking about, or the efficiency of, of the, uh, it doesn't matter which when you look at velocity of the droplet or efficiency of the chemotaxis. And you get two clusters of points in both of these. This cluster of points, uh, is either because you put in cells that don't make surfactant um, or you put in a, a control, which is just the growth medium, so no cells, or cells that don't make surfactant or cells that do make surfactant, but you've killed them. So they're not alive anymore. And you then get no chemotaxis or movement from the system. But the systems that move better and are chemotactic are either the ones where you added the surfactant like we've done in the previous experiment, Decano 8, this, we added this to the system or we don't add any surfactant and we put in lung cancer cells that actually make their own surfactant. And there are the blue dots in these, in these, uh, in these uh, graphs. So you can see what you need to do in order to get yourself moving in these experiments. You need to be a cell line that makes biosurfactants and you need to survive in the system. Cool. Question. What is the surfactant that they we, make? We don't know. We don't know, Doron. So, so these, these are um, lung cells. So they make these biosurfactants that are uh, found in human lungs. So you know there are quite a bit of a mixture of different phospholipids and things, right, that are made in, in the human lungs. So it's whatever those are. We never were able to get the characterization done partially because of COVID lockdown nonsense, but we're going to find out. We've done the isolation of the of lipid, lipoidal fraction. We just haven't run the analysis. When, when you say they excrete surfactants, is this in the form of micelles? Mm. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Because if they're, if they're phospholipids, 
they could completely skip the, the micelle phase, right? So, so I'm not sure. Yeah, not sure. More questions? Okay, this brings me to the third part of the talk here. A little bit of origin of life scenario for those of you guys, those of you guys who like origin of life stuff, and just a brief, a brief little thing. Um, so we started playing with this a while ago because all of the experiments that I've been doing up to that point uh, were done with, you know, very few components, purified components, you know, 99.99% pure components. And everything that I was reading about and interested in about origin of life, talk about that uh, any kind of organic chemistry that you would find at the origin of life is a mess of all kinds of different types of molecules. Because you have basically highly uncontrolled chemical processes that give rise to a, a repertoire of organic molecules that is not 99.9% .9 pure of anything. Um, and so trying to then merge the self-moving droplet system with something that I thought was more interesting and relevant to the origin of life, we started uh, making uh, basically a organic soup in the lab and the organic soup basically looks like this brown tar here rather than some pure chemical which could be this clear liquid here which this is actually oleic acid in this one here and um, what we what we decided to play with was the self polymerization of hydrogen cyanide uh, making extensive polymers like this polyamine here and um, there are several papers on this the self polymerization of, of hydrogen and cyanide in, in origin of life studies, for example, this is one talking about pre prebiotic chemistry on the moon Titan. Okay, there's a lot of hydrogen cyanide and evidence for these extended organic molecules that are produced presumably abiotically. And um, so we're able to make this stuff in the lab in these kinds of setups here. So you have to be very careful when making playing with cyanide, of course. This is the, the stirred chamber where we're dripping in some acid into some sodium cyanide to make more and more polymers. And what does this look like? Here's a time course of the reaction. This is uh, early part of the reaction, middle part of the reaction. And after a few days, you see that the system is getting richer and richer organically because it's changing colors, right? So this is how you know. It's the same reason you know you've gone too far with cooking in your kitchen when everything starts turning black because you've added too much heat or too long or both. So you're making all these chemical bonds, making and breaking chemical bonds. And so that's what this black stuff is here. And so what we wanted to do was take this droplet system that was normally powered by ultra pure anhydride that produces these surfactants and protons. We take that out of the system and instead we substitute in this stuff, uh, whatever this stuff is. Now this is just part of the structure that is polymerized when you have hydrogen cyanide. Um, the polymers are very varied. I mean, you're looking at a very high complexity of, of organic molecules. So basically this black stuff is what we produced. And this black stuff is what we wanted to see if it can power the motion of our droplets. So here's the experiment. So what you're looking at are two droplets that are freshly added to a water uh, system here. And the black stuff that you see inside the oil at the interface between the oil and the water, out in the water, this is all this hydrogen cyanide mess, right? Um, nothing was purified in advance. So it just goes everywhere. It's just this, yeah, sticky black stuff like tar. It goes everywhere. And this is what we see. So within the first few seconds, they start to convect and start to move around in the system. The movement is very, very slow compared to the anhydride system, but it's still there. And we also see some chemotaxis like we saw with the previous systems. Here's the chemical gradient here. So they also appear to be sensitive to the chemical gradient and be able to convect directionally into the gradient to a certain extent. It's really compared to, you know, the pure systems is not as good, but it still does work. 
So here's just a conclusion for this part, and then I'll wrap things up in case you guys want to have a discussion about anything. So for this part, um, what I tried to show is that you can use these HCN polymers, which are again, undefined um, and not purified in any way to support self movement and chemotaxis of this system. So you don't have to work with pure systems anymore necessarily. And the fuel is, is interesting because we don't know what it is. Um, it's not explicitly defined in the system. Um, the, the chemical composition of these polymers is immense. So it's going to take a very, very long time and more sophisticated instruments to figure out what is actually in them. But we have done the physical characterization and showed, first of all, there are surfactants in the system which change the interfacial tension. So we can see that. And the change in interfacial tension with whatever the molecules are, are sensitive to pH. So they're also uh, sensitive to this kind of, uh, and, and I think then responsible for the chemotaxis that we see. And, um, and so again, if you believe me that having this, uh, this self-moving system that is going towards equilibrium, but is able to move away from its products, um, we, this is kind of a simple way that even a primitive system could avoid equilibrium for a certain amount of time by moving to a fresh environment. Okay, so here are just some conclusions. I talked about coupling chemistry with droplets to produce self-moving systems, and they're also capable of chemotaxis. And you could use these to do fun things like solve mazes, or they exhibit also some group dynamics. Um, we could use these as transporters of living, of living cells, and that messy conditions can also power these self-moving uh, systems. Um, so what we're interested in here are how you could how you get, a, you get coupling between systems. In this, in this particular case, you get coupling between a simple chemical system and its environment. So I think I've hopefully demonstrated to you guys that these chemical systems are indeed very sensitive to their environments and can react in a certain way to them, especially through self-movement. So they can act and react with the environment, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and it, perhaps these have an emergent mechanism to avoid equilibrium. And what I mentioned in the middle there is we're playing now with these systems where you have a living system that complements the artificial system and the artificial system that complements the living system. Because when we had those transport of human cells around, um, the, the droplets would not move without the biosurfactants and the living cells would not move unless they're moved by the droplet, right? So they kind of depend on each other to make the system uh, into one functional coherent system. And we're interested still in high, how highly complex messy systems that you don't purify could actually self-organize into interesting, maybe interesting lifelike behaviors. Um, Self-movement is just, is just one of those. So, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to have a discussion if you'd like. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I, I really yeah. love your droplets, irrespective of whether or not they're relevant for the original life i think it's fun it's not really really fun so yeah so i'm sure that there are questions so, so if there are questions please uh, mute yourself and uh, ask the question I, I, but i have a i may i may want to start uh, you know it, uh, certainly this uh, chemical taxes uh, properties can be used for drug delivery yeah so you, you can set up in such a way that uh, this can be used you know ca you know couple with uh, these nano carriers this can be uh, you know a, a, a cargo for transporting a drug delivery. I mean, for... yeah, it's it's uh, it'd be interesting to explore that more because um, since these are fluid dynamical systems, <laughs> there are certain size, there are certain scale boundaries that you have to be wary of, and so the droplets themselves cannot get too small, or they cannot support convective motion anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so if you can do something that is, um, you know, on the size scale of cells. Um, then you're getting started to get into trouble. So, so these are probably better suited for larger systems. So movement within capillaries and things like that would be more suitable for these things. Um, and yeah, and then kind of just playing with that a little bit, you know, how, how do you, can you make one of these systems that auto selects for living versus dead cells? So we're able to show that at least as a very primitive example of what you might use this for, you know, cause cell sorting is very important, right? It's a huge, it's a huge industry cell sorting. So can you make a real cheap cell sorter just by mixing oil and water together? You know, if you just need to sort a few cells, mm. that kind of thing. 
Okay, thank you. Other yeah. questions? Uh, I have a, mm -hmm. an ill-posed question. It, yeah. it, I might have missed something, but it looks to me that uh, your um, plates, uh, once you put the droplets in, uh, you, you put the water in, uh, are essentially uh, isolated systems. Yeah. So uh, my, my question is, what happens if you make a non-isolated system with some kind of energy flow or matter flow or heat flow or whatever? Yeah. Um, we haven't tried that. So these are absolutely isolated systems that are just turning towards equilibrium, right? That's everything I've shown. With one exception, with one thing I did not show, is we were able to um, we're able to design and program an, a robotic arm that monitors what the droplets are doing, and when the droplets stop moving because they basically exhaust their fuel supply, that they then get refilled with an injection of more fuel. Okay. So that's yeah, that's a very yeah, it's engineered, it's a design. Yeah, that's a design. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but doing something more interesting, like you're saying, because you're that would be very nice because if you have no, these, these kinds of um, uh, environments that we're putting them in are they're very simple and well controlled, right? You then would have you have one diffusing chemical, for example. There's nothing more exotic than this. So having a more open system uh, where you have these exchanges would be really really interesting, and we haven't done anything with that. Okay. Yep. Please come to Trento, Roberto. Well, I I would like to. <laughs> that the COVID uh, is causing some delay, but <laughs> yes, okay. I understand. <laughs> Martin, yes, um, you, beautiful talk. Thank A you. lot of what you have done borders on it somehow relates to interplay between oils and surfactants. Yeah. Now. What is really interesting in what is life like is growth. Yes. And do you see? Do you do you try to move in the direction of what happens in the original famous Luigi Luisi experiment, in which you get growth because uh, a surfactant assembly helps make more assembly, making molecules yeah. from oil. Um, so this might, if, if there was, and, and then if you put this together with movement, directional movement and perhaps fusion, uh, this could be very interesting. But the, I'm asking, is there anything about growth and is there anything about fission and fusion? Yeah. So the first system I showed drawn with the anhydride fuel is the same exact chemistry that Luigi Luisi used in his... Um, autocatalytic formation of yes the absolutely yes so the same exact chemistry and that's where it came from right from his papers yes so that's that would that's what influenced that that whole line of investigation um whether there's an autocatalytic effect i don't know in the system so this has to be or catalytic but the, the main point is that dynamics that have to do with movement in space in three dimensions, two dimensions, mm -hmm. is extremely interesting. But it would be nice to see an interplay, interplay with different phenomenology that comes up with similar composition of material that you are using, right? And uh, and the question is whether you can actually direct the experiments towards having that this kind of interplay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Doing, doing fission and fusion cycles is trivial. So we've shown this, Dora. I didn't have time to present it today because- But, but, but chemically driven such? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. What, what would be an example? Um, so we have, in that particular one that we did, we have, um, and it's a bit complicated, is you have two different droplet populations, each solvating a different surfactant. One is a cationic, one is anionic, okay? You put those in, in the same arena, and then you manipulate the conditions such that you have either fusion or fission of the system. And it's a bit hard to, to, to just talk about, you have to drive these things away from equilibrium 
And then as they come back towards equilibrium, they do either a fusion or fission event. So I have a, we have a paper published on this. But this is nice for you, Doron, because these are very simple surfactants that we use. We use oleic acid and CTAB, I think were the main ones we used for the cationic pair. So last question on my part, uh, do the droplets actually have surfactant coating? Yes. All yes. of them. We've measured this with tensiometry. And you can see it with light microscopy when we look at fluorescence as well. So basically you are talking about uh, grandiose my, micelles with guard. a very big, a guard very, very big belly. Okay. <laughs> with a big, uh, big, big belly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But this is something we can talk about, uh, Doron. I can tell you, show you those, those experiments. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions, please? Sir. I yeah. have a question uh, too. Hi, John. Hi, Martin. Hi. <laughs> um, actually, two questions. Um, uh, one's a little bit related to the previous question. And uh, the, that question is basically, uh, you know that the uh, uh, extrusion was a technique to create fission. Yeah. And the, the simple question is, have you explored any scenarios where the actual self motion of the droplet would be sufficient to uh, drive it through an extrusion pore and create fission mechanically from its own self locomotion? And the other question, which is sort of related to that indirectly, is uh, uh, do any of these systems work now in closed systems like inside capillaries or do you need to have the open interface? Uh, okay, so um, the, the answer to the first one is no, we've tried many times because we can control the, the motion of these droplets with the chemical gradients, right? So imagine you put chemical gradient through a small capillary and you want it to then try to move through. And it's, it's tough. The droplets don't want to deform very easily and pass through these small, you know, maybe you just need to get the right scale, which we haven't tried exhaustively to do this. But what does work, uh, John, is um, I, I mentioned that there's a certain scale by which you can sustain a convective cell. And if you get big enough, then you, can, can, you could actually sustain more than one convective cell at the same time. So we work with bigger droplets and then we induced fluid dynamics such that you get opposite, op opposing vectors and the, and the droplet pulls itself apart. So without extrusion, but you know, extrusion works because of fluid dynamics, right? So, right. but this is a self-generated fluid dynamic that then pulls the, the droplet mm -hmm. apart. So we've able, been able to do that uh, to answer that part of the question. Um, and what, what was the second one, sorry? The second question is about w whether you can get uh, uh, navigation of droplets inside closed channels where you don't have an open interface. Yes, yes. So um, with some of these systems, um, they are, I didn't explain this at all actually in the talk, but um, you, there's a, sometimes there's a called a, like I call it a carrier oil and this is an oil phase that does not participate in the chemistry. And the only reason it's there, uh, apart from embodiment, is to change the relative density of the droplet. So we make heavy droplets that sink to the bottom. And this is why I claim that we have swimmers, because they are ab absolutely submerged into the water. And though in those systems, then you could have them, for example, climb up, up gradients that are all completely uh, up, up uh, how would you say, up ramps that are completely enclosed and things like this. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So could that, because that might provide a mechanism for creating sort of indefinite propagation if you can uh, uh, have the droplet continually move into fresh fluid, yeah. you know, along a long channel. Yes, absolutely. So the work, this is an intriguing question and, and my work does not show this, but there's work uh, by Sugawara that you know in, in uh, Japan who did a, a similar droplet system. And instead of having the fuel be in the droplet, like the fuel is in your car, um, he placed a catalyst in the droplet and the fuel is outside in the environment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this system can self move. And that one can move indefinitely, in my opinion, because the catalyst is in the droplet, right? And then all the fuel that you want is out in the environment. You just need to move into it. Right. That's right. what I was thinking. That's so there's a paper. There's a paper by Sugawara on that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think it might have something. 
have the words immortal droplets in it. <laughs> okay. If you can't find it, tell me, I'll, I'll email you. There was another question. Yes. Uh, yeah, actually. Uh, thank you, Martin. It was very interesting. Um, and it might be stupid, but uh, it's uh, like uh, two questions in one. Okay. Um, first of all, so the system um, in which you display chemotaxis without the, just with the droplet, without any cells, have you ever thought about uh, applying it um, using multiple, let's say, population of droplets to uh, artificial morphogenesis? No, I haven't thought about it. It's an interesting because, uh, point because the development of, of cellular tissues it depends on the directed motion of the cells in, in three-dimensional space, right? Yeah, with the gradients of chemicals. So. Yep, with creation, creation, you know, gradients of, of chemicals, exactly right. So there is that uh, parallel that could be made with biological systems. Yeah, I think people are in need of a of simpler model for that because we don't understand everything. Okay. And there are a lot of model, mathematical models that actually predict what should happen, but I think it would be really cool to have that in a, okay. using a very smaller, but a less uh, experimentally heavy uh, uh, device. And so the I other one- I can show you, um, when I come to the lab, I can show you an experiment we did with a population of droplets that appear to themselves undergo convection, okay. which is what you want. Yeah. That you're talking about, right, because that's what that's what living cells do to make these tissues. Yeah. And the second part was uh, if you manage to encapsulate cell and make them survive long enough, um, would it be um, science fiction to think about uh, cells, uh, cell sorter, in which the activity of a cell, what it produces, like for instance. Uh, to just go back on Helicobacter pylori, it can produce a lot of urea, so it can change a lot of pH, and then it would move the droplet in which it's contained within your reactor, yeah. like having some uh, activity based uh, cell sorting. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but some of the parameters now are becoming clear to us. For example, by just doing a whole bunch of different experiments and looking at um, what kind of surface tension differences are responsible for the motion? Yeah. Okay, so now if we understand how motion correlates with surface tension difference, which would be from one side of the droplet to the other, let's say, um, we then could make predictions about how a droplet might behave with different types of surfactants and different types of stimuli. So okay. yeah, so it's possible now, I think, to make some predictions with some preliminary measurements on how this actually might work and find the right regime where you can yeah. actually get the droplets to move. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. There is another question from here. From okay. here. Yeah. Yeah. Just a very good question. I really enjoyed this presentation and this uh, talk. It was completely new for me. Um, first of all, quick comments uh, regarding Japanese research. Um, there is a recent recent work by Naruse Tali about. Um, like a computational model of intelligent behavior of living beings, very simple ones, so like amoeba and stuff. So yeah. it might be interesting to like, try to apply this computational method to this research. Yes. Um, the question I had there was um, just a matter of curiosity in general, because we know that we are dealing with droplets that are not alive in themselves. Yeah. That well, um, I'm wondering if uh, we would not be sure that this stuff is not living, how could it be possible to understand that it's not living? So are there any like, tests and so on? So? No, I don't have any tests to, to say that they're not living. I guess that anything that I touch is probably not living. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a personal bias. But there is, it then becomes you know, of a more of a, it's not only philosophical, but pra practical issue. For those of us who are interested in this idea of artificial cells, so who decides that you've created an artificial life form or not? Is it going to be a human or is it going to be something else like a bacterium, for example? So, so there are some people who are actively looking at basically coming up with a Turing test for these artificial systems. And then who is going to be adjudicator on this is, becomes a question. It doesn't necessarily have to be a human who decides that these are alive or yeah, live or, or whatever. Um, I think it's, 
just politically safe to say that, you know, all this stuff is artificial and it's not alive and it appears to mimic some living systems. I think that's safer to say than, you know, proclaiming that these artificial systems are alive. Um, it becomes very messy. You know, the, the argument becomes messy and actually, unfortunately, not very scientific as well. So that's why I kind of steer away from that. But, you know, if you, if you then come up with an interesting Turing test, I'd be interested in seeing what, what that could be. Yeah. To make the determination. You know, the big, the thing that's, the huge thing that's missing from all this, which I think is of utmost importance is that they, I didn't talk about information at all, although there might be information ex implicit in the system. And I didn't at all talk about evolution. You know, these are absolutely fundamental in my view, as far as making a, a living system. But that's just my personal point of view. Okay. I think I don't see any other questions. Uh, nope, I don't see any more questions. Yes. So it was very, you know, it was, you know, it was really fun to have you with us. And, you know, we all enjoyed the, your, your talk. So thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you all for being, for being with us. And uh, I hope to see you soon uh, in Venice because I, 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 there is a lot of things that, uh, the, there are a lot of things that I want to discuss with you in this respect, you know, I will okay. tell you something about this. And right. so until that time, uh, you know, yes. uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, hopefully soon. So thank you. Thank you all for being with us and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you for yes, having thanks, me. Thank you. thank you for thank coming. You. Thank thanks you. a lot, Martin. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye, Serge. <laughs>